So I um, would like to, we have a special guest on tonight. I'm very, very excited, and it's a treat for you guys. Um, our CEO and president, Leslie Stevens. I want to tell you a little bit about Leslie. Um, you know, she's amazing. She's, I mean, pretty much anything you need to know about sleep, breathing, pediatric airway health, she's, she's the lady. Um, she is a mother of three. Um, her goal and desire is to provide every advantage for children to allow them to live healthy and happy lives. Um, there's a silent epidemic affecting nine out of 10 children, and this epidemic manifests itself in a variety of symptoms that can be easily overlooked, misdiagnosed, and most unfortunately left untreated. It's absolutely critical that children are evaluated for sleep and breathing habits. So Leslie is not only our fearless leader, she actually lectures and she trains all over the world. Um, I don't think there's a question, as I mentioned, in reference to the subject of pediatric sleep breathing and airway health and Healthy Starts Connection that she cannot answer. And, and you know, when you have a back, the backing of a company like Healthy Start for Orthocane with over 51 years, over 4 million cases, and tons of research, so research to back her, you know, that, that, that helps. Um, Leslie's mission is to educate both parents and oral physicians to ensure children a lifetime of health, happiness, and success. So without further ado, I have the um, privilege to um, hand the floor and the screen and the mic over to Leslie Stevens. Well, thank you so much, Susie. Um, as always, it's just a pleasure to be here, and um, I look forward to spending the night um, going through a little bit about um, sleep disorder breathing. Um, I'm not sure how much the audience knows about it, but um, I will assume not much, so we'll start from the beginning and go through it. Um, please ask questions, um, uh, interrupt whatever you feel. Um, I would love to um, answer whatever you have. Um, I am um, so fortunate I made it. Today I spent the day at NYU Orthodontic Department um, educating uh, the orthodontists, the residents, the faculty, and it was um, truly an outstanding um, day. I, I was ecstatic about the response and um, hopefully the implementation of the Healthy Start at NYU. So anyways, um, Let's get started. Um, sleep disorder breathing um, is obviously, I, I feel, probably gonna be one of the biggest things that we see in dentistry. Um, no longer do I feel a dentist is just a dentist. In fact, I feel it. you are more the oral physician. You have the expertise in this field. Um, it is amazing what we identify um, as root causes in the oral cavity and um, what we see as outward symptoms. So let's kind of go over a little bit about what this silent crisis is all about. So when we talk about identification and education to parents, to patients, basically we're explaining the outward symptoms that occur. Um, and we go through a list of outward symptoms that parents should pay attention to in their child. And these symptoms include ADD, ADHD, bedwetting, um, difficulty in school, especially math, science, spelling, and even reading, um, mouth breathing, snoring, restless sleep, delayed or stunted growth, nightmares, um, irritability, anger, morning headaches, um, the list goes on and on. Um, but what is so important and imperative for you to express to the parents is that it it is something that is extremely common to see in these children. In fact, our research indicates that nine out of 10 children will have one or more of these outward symptoms. And I know um, there are a couple individuals that always comment to me, um, researchers that say, it's too severe, please don't use that number. Can you use an adjective like many? And I said, well, obviously if we have the research, we're using the statistic because that, that's the whole point of doing research. So I was in Rome just um, a couple weeks ago, and I don't know if you're familiar with a Dr. Derek Mahoney, who's out of Australia. He did a research study on 5,000 children, um, and he found that 92% of them had one or more outward symptoms of sleep. So there you go. We, um, you know, the numbers are coming in, and the numbers seem to be. Um, correlating. So let's go back to these outward symptoms that parents um, most frequently see in their children. 
And unfortunately, what parents have been doing is identifying these issues, but looking them at them as an individual scenario. So maybe it's ADD and ADHD. Well, they'll investigate that diagnosis, which we obviously realize is um, a criteria that needs to be met, not a blood test or anything like that. And um, the uh, treatment for ADD and ADHD many times involves um, drugs, um, whether it's a stimulant or other prescription drugs, um, allergies, we see uh, you know, going to the allergist, steroids, um, others outward symptoms maybe include um, visits, psychiatric testing, counseling, therapy, surgery, sleep studies. So there are numerous types of treatment for these individual outward symptoms. And the problem is, it's exactly that. They're addressing the symptom, not the root cause. And many times these drugs tend to be short-term band-aids. And unfortunately, sometimes they often involve several drugs and these drugs have many side effects. And all in all, these treatments can be costly, painful, time-consuming, and unfortunately, ineffective. So research over the past 20 years has basically linked these outward symptoms to root causes. And these root causes include mouth breathing, narrow palate, improper tongue placement, jaw relationships. And as a dental professional, basically you have the knowledge, you have the tools to impact the development of a child's airway to increase the oxygen intake and reduce the carbon dioxide buildup. So today it's now far more, it's about far more than cavities and straight teeth. It's actually about the overall future health and the well being of every child. So hopefully tonight we're gonna go through and identify sleep disorder breathing symptoms, evaluate these symptoms, understand and identify the root cause, diagnose, diagnose the problem, and finally treat. I will bring up that the ADA has created policy. This policy came into effect in a vote um, about a year and a half ago in October of 2017. And this policy basically indicates that every dentist needs to evaluate sleep. They need to educate themselves on airway health and basically learn to promote the growth and development of the child. And that's basically what Healthy Start does. So um, looking at that policy, realizing that the ADA is trying to be in the forefront in this area of airway, sleep, and breathing, and be basically um, ask the membership, um, the dentist in the United States to be aware of this, to identify it, and hopefully be able to treat. So as a dental professional or an oral physician, um, use, use everything you have in your toolbox to evaluate these kids. Um, initially, so much can be gained just by observation. So if you see children coming in, obviously take a look at the way they're looking. Obviously, we see here deep circles under the eyes. We see separation of the lips, tendency for mouth breathing. Um, look at the profile of the patient. You can see how we have such a deficiency in the lower third of the face, especially the mandible. Many times though, we do see the maxilla both in a retrusive position. Lips open, tendency is for mouth breathing. Also, we see a rolled lip. You'll see how that affects what that condition, the oral condition is um, of that dentition. The other thing we notice is how the chin actually blends into the neck. Um, there is no definition. It is basically a funnel that we call. So again, let's go over the root causes. We're going to look at mouth breathing. Um, it is a habit. Um, these habits, especially mouth breathing, allows the mandible and the tongue to displace posteriorly um, with the reduced airway and air exchange to the lungs. Habits like finger sucking and abnormal tongue posture and swallowing. We see upper arch constriction and high palate, decreasing nasal breathing. And because this breathing is impacted, we see a reduced REM sleep. And the REM sleep obviously requires oxygen. If the oxygen is being impacted, then they don't receive 
and they don't go into REM sleep. And this REM sleep obviously affects brain function, endocrine, and immune systems. When do we treat? We try to treat as early as possible. Actually, if we notice an outward symptom, we already know 92.6% of the time that symptom will not self-correct. In fact, it will get worse with age. 30% will get worse with age. So when we're looking at these children, we realize that we have a certain period of time to catch them during their growth period. Um, typically, we want to look at these kids anywhere from 2 to 12 years of age. And you can see how much of the cranial facial growth occurs at these ages. So even at two years of age, we know that 68% of the males have completed their growth. And we understand 73% of the females have um, developed already. Um, if we look at age 12, we see that 89% in the male and 94% in the female. So we want to catch them as early as possible. Um, you know, the range between 2 and 12 is rather arbitrary. We do see um, sometimes a 10-year-old female that's really developing like a 12-year-old. So um, it's, it's basically looking at the developmental age of that patient. The other thing to note is look at the growth pattern that happens in craniofacial growth. We have a forward and down movement that occurs during growth and development. And basically, the Healthy Start treatment is going to mimic that type of growth and obviously promote it for that child. So again, the normal growth and development of the face and jaw is forward and down. So the question basically needs to be asked, so why many, so many children are not experiencing this normal growth and development, as well as basically impacting their social and personality development as well. So how we have determined this basic up, um, um, most frequent type of conditions and see this epidemic that is occurring is basically kind of threefold. We see that children have had a prolonged use of um, pacifiers. Um, we'd like to see the pacifier um, gone by the age of six months. Um, if you never use it, that's fine. Um, pacifiers tend to be uh, uh, a convenience of a parent, unfortunately. Obviously, we want our child to soothe, but we don't want to hear the crying. Um, prolonged nipple bottle feeding beyond six to eight months is also um, lack of breastfeeding and soft diet. So um, unfortunately, industrialization has changed the way we um, conduct our lives. It's very Infrequently, we hear a mother that's breastfed for, or breastfeeds their child for two years. Um, it, it's just the way it is. And um, unfortunately, this is part of what we're seeing, and we're seeing it in a more epidemic type of number. So again, when we're visually looking at kids, what are we looking for? Well, if we see an open bite similar to this, Realize that this is probably a result of extended pacifier and prolonged nipple bottle use, also possibly finger sucking, also a tongue thrust. Um, when we address the airway and look at it, we need to look at the nasal cavity. We're looking at the hard palate, the soft palate, the tongue, how it's affecting the airway, um, how those conditions um, basically can be functioning improperly, and how we can address them and provide not only the proper habits, but also the architecture basically of the oral cavity. Let's talk a little bit about the nose. A nose is a very um, overlooked and important function that we see in the body. So the nose basically has five functions. It serves as an air passageway. It warms and moistens inhaled hair. Um, the membrane traps dust, pollen, bacteria, and other foreign matter. It contains receptors with so, which sort out odors, and it also adds in the quality and the pronunciation of words. How many times have we seen these kind of children? Obviously, this is not a good scenario. Um, many times on Facebook, we see moms that say, wow, look how exhausted my child is. Well, this open mouth scenario is a big problem, and this 
isn't typically what we should see. And I'm going to show you a video in a few minutes that will um, speak to that point. Um, so when we look at mouth breathing, our most recent e research indicated that 43% of the population actually mouth breathe. So here's the video I was just speaking about. It's Eli. Um, I want you to listen carefully to the way the child breathes. I want you to see how he um, brings his breathing back by turning his head. And I want to see, show you what that mom learned to do. Um, what's important to understand that even at this young age, if we see a problem, we need to correct it. Again, 92.6% will not self-correct and 30% will get worse with age. So. Let me bring on Eli and take a listen. Now he's holding it. That was holding it. He's still holding it. He's trying to take in air. There he goes. Now watch. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's still holding his breath. And now he's going to gulp again. There he goes. Is it again? And again, he's holding. He's holding. He's trying. There he goes. So this has been three minutes and fifteen seconds, and you can see how many episodes he's had of not getting calm breaths in. Now, watch what happens. When I take his jaw and I just bring it forward, if I can, let's see if I can. And I open its airway. Just bring his airway forward. Now listen to the quiet breathing. There we go. Now he's breathing through his nose. And I brought his airway, I'm opening his airway, pulling his jaw forward ever so slightly. And now he's breathing through his nose quietly. His mouth is a little bit open, but he's breathing through his nose. Just by here, how quietly he's breathing, you don't hear him anymore. And all I did is gently bring his jaw forward. Kind of amazing. Well, this is one aspect of what the Healthy Start is going to do. Actually bring that lower jaw forward, put him in the right position, prevent the mouth breathing, encourage the nasal breathing. And we'll talk a little bit about the myofunctional therapy that's built into these appliances. So Internally, you can't see where that tongue is placed, but the tongue needs to be in the upper palate as well as creating the proper swallow. And all of these appliances have that built-in ability to help a child um, create the proper um, swallow as well as the proper tongue position. So um, again, let's talk a little bit about airway. What is a normal airway and what's a restricted airway? So here on the right-hand side, you'll see this airway is what we call a normal airway. Sometimes we say it resembles more to a garden hose. And unfortunately, the child on the left has a constricted airway. And sometimes we refer to that as a coffee stirrer. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but it's a good visual for, for parents. Um, I actually decided one day that I was going to try to breathe through that coffee stirrer and see how difficult that was. Well, my great intentions lasted all of about 10 or 15 minutes. And I'll tell you, I had the most massive headache I've ever had, um, could not get rid of it, doesn't matter how many aspirin I took. And I just thought, imagine these children that are spending their entire night breathing through an airway like this, or even daytime. And, um, you know, we quite frequently hear about headaches in these children. And wow, they probably don't know any different. And this has been their constant way of life. So I just bring that up. If you like to try it, I'm just giving you a heads up what it's going to be like, but um, absolutely um, get those visuals um, for your patients. Um, 
What's interesting, um, I don't know how many of you have seen a CBCT scan. Um, this is an image that we can gather um, from that type of technology. Um, what is interesting is um, there is kind of a um, accepted norm that we would see in the dimension of an airway. And how we calculate that is we take the age of the patient starting at age five, multiply it by 10 to get that square millimeter dimension. So if you had a nine-year-old, what this patient happens to be, we would do nine times 10. So we would anticipate to see an airway volume of 90 square millimeters. So the dimension of this particular patient is actually 53.6 square millimeters. So they're deficient. So the Healthy Start was introduced and the, actually the Healthy Start appliance was put into the mouth and one month during progress of this treatment, a second CBCT scan was taken. Now, typically we would see the airway grow up until age 17. At age 17, we would anticipate to see an adult airway anywhere between 150 and 170 square millimeters. Um, bad story is at age 21, that airway starts to deteriorate over the lifetime. And um, obviously we see many adult patients with sleep apnea. Um, the question has always been, did they reach this optimal of 150 to 170 square millimeters or is 150 to 170 square millimeters not enough to sustain through a lifetime? Well, after one month of progress with the Healthy Start, that CBCT scan indicated that this patient had a 337 square millimeter airway dimension. Now that's over double what we would anticipate seeing in an adult. So we are currently underway um, in research projects that are basically looking at this, looking at the stability of that measurement and watching these kids over a period of time. So we will re be reporting back to you exactly what these research brings us, but um, the initial evaluation and what doctors are seeing is kind of astronomical. So many times we might take a, a cephalometric and look at the airway of a child and it can be completely normal. However, when we look at a sleep questionnaire, we find that the children have all sorts of outward symptoms. So how can that be? Well, that could be a result of a habitual problem, not a skeletal problem. So a habitual problem can happen, again, as I said, mouth breathing being most severe. If a patient opens their mouth just a half an inch, we basically can restrict the airway up to six millimeters. Well, this is a problem, especially in a seven-year-old, if a seven-year-old's um, airway is seven millimeters and we take away six millimeters, that's gonna leave a child with a coffee stir airway, which basically is about one millimeter. So um, obviously this is a problem and this is something that should be explained to a parent so they can understand how detrimental that mouth breathing can be. It also affects obviously how the air is transmitted into the body, there is no filter. So we tend to see tonsils um, enlarged, adenoids enlarged. Um, typically these kids have a lot of um, infection. Um, they're sick a lot. Um, we also see kids that have allergies because the air is not filtered, filtered. It comes into the body. It's basically processed. The body reacts. Um, we see eczema as part of this conversation. So, so many things happen because of the mouth breathing. And obviously it's a condition that's relatively easy to correct if we can use the right treatment. So what we're looking for is a garden hose of an airway as opposed to a coffee stirrer. So as we complete the cycle, we're looking at mouth breathing and snoring as basically being a result of extended bottle feeding and pacifier use. Um, poor tongue position and abnormal swallow, um, eating sugar, processed foods, poor oral habits such as thumb and finger sucking, tongue thrusts, etc. And mouth breathing will lead to a compromised airway. And this compromised airway basically reduces airway, restricts airflow, reduces oxygen, increases CO2, 
affects brain function, immune and endocrine systems, um, creates swollen abnoids and tonsils, um, creates a low tongue pos position and a tongue thrust. Um, it creates underdeveloped dental arches, especially overjet, open bite, and cross bites. So a compromised airway basically is then results or transmits into a sleep disorder breathing um, symptom, which has outward conditions that resemble restless sleep, ADD, ADHD, bedwetting, chronic allergies, nightmares, daytime drowsiness, aggression, um, difficulty in school, and frequent infections. So let's talk a little bit about what we can do, how we can address this, the healthy start system, how it is incorporated into a, child, a child's daily life, um, how easy it is. Um, majority of the time, these appliances are worn simply at night, passively while they sleep, to um, basically correct these conditions. So again, the conditions or the root causes that Healthy Start will be addressing is we're going to be expanding the dental arches. We're going to establish nasal breathing. We're going to train the tongue. We're going to eliminate bad habits. We're going to advance the mandible to correct the overjet. We're going to encourage proper facial and body growth since the lack of REM sleep impairs function of adrenal glands to secrete growth hormones. And frosting on the cake, we're going to correct most orthodontic problems. And these include ideal overbite and overjet, proper intercuspation of the dentition, molar relations to a class one, all 28 teeth in place by the age of 12. Um, provide fiber bundle or fiber development on straight teeth for stability. It reduces and eliminates future relapse and it reduces the chance for possible orthodontic treatment at a later time. Um, the research, one of the research projects we were talking was done on 500 children. And basically it was looking at the screening devices that we have to identify this and basically help a parent understand. So um, this research basically had parents, um, 501 of them, um, fill out a Healthy Start Sleep questionnaire. And this basically includes 27 of the most prevalent um, symptoms that we see associated with sleep, breathing, and airway problems. Um, these um, conditions would be basically identified in the first column, the initial, and we would present or identify them with a severity index from zero to five, five being the most pronounced. What is interesting, or let me go over some of the results and I'll tell you an interesting um, correlation that we found. Obviously, mouth breathing and snoring are the most commonly associated with more sleep disorder breathing symptoms than any other symptom. Nine out of 10 children had one or more outward symptoms of sleep. 60% of the sample had four or more symptoms. One out of five children experienced bedwetting, which is kind of an eye-opening statistic. It's 18.7%. So think about it, the classroom of 20 kids, four of them will be bedwetters at a later age. I think it's a lot more common than we anticipated. Obviously, it's not something um, we broadcast, but it's something to be aware of and obviously um, really impacts that child's ability to socialize. Um, they feel defeated. Um, you know, it's very difficult for them to control it. Parents try all sorts of different things. Um, but what is interesting is when we um, can address it with Healthy Start by looking at um, airway, looking at and correcting the mouth breathing, encouraging the nasal breathing, and basically putting the body back into balance. We seem to be very successful in addressing bedwetting in children. Um, as we had said, between ages four and 12, 92.6% of the symptoms that we would see as outward symptoms of sleep did not self-correct and 30% worsened with age. So below mouth breathing, as we talked about, half inch of opening reduces airway by six millimeters. We found that mouth breathing was the most prevalent and obviously causes the most um, impact. But the ones in bold are also some that you should pay closer attention to um, when you're having a conversation um, with parents. 
If a child mouth breathes at night, we find they have seven other outward symptoms. If a child mouth breathes both during the day and night, typically found eight other outward symptoms. And here are some of the most frequent ones that are associated with the mouth breathing. So what are the implications of the study? Basically the findings show that sleep disorder breathing is much more common and affects children even as young as two years of age. Actually, new research has showed that um, an unborn fetus actually can demonstrate sleep disorder breathing symptoms. So kind of think about it. If a mom is having um, issues with sleep and restricted airflow, obviously that's transmitted to the infant or to the fetus and um, issues occur. Um, if you have a premature baby, obviously they're three times greater to have sleep issues just because that last month of development um, basically helps with the oral cavity and the development of such, so it's impacted. Um, we have discussed begin treatment as early as possible to ensure more permanent changes. Um, and this is just basically an overall outlook. Identifying outward symptoms displayed in 90% of the children that enter your practice can significantly reduce this epidemic and enable you to successfully treat the overall health of your patients. We say no longer it's just about the teeth. It's really about the overall health of the patient. And the position of the teeth, the structure of the oral cavity is, is one of the outward symptoms of what we see in sleep disorder breathing. Um, here is an interesting study. The top three images are of a patient that had a normal night's sleep, and this is the MRI or the activity that occurred in the brain. Um, the second and the lower three are images of one night of sleep deprivation. And if we see that, look at the only brain activity that we see. That's shocking that that one night can cause that kind of um, impact in brain function. Here are some interesting studies that have occurred. Um, this Lulu Zai, actually out of University of Rochester, was evaluating Alzheimer and dementia and actually found a toxin that builds up in the fluid around the brain, um, around the brain um, blood cells. So as the uh, you work during the day, the blood cells expand and the toxins build up. When you go into REM sleep, those brain cells basically shrink and the toxins are washed away from that fluid. So then when you wake up in the morning, the cycle begins all over. Now, what happens if a child does not go into REM sleep? Well, obviously it's going to cause the buildup of those toxins, um, which we see many times in Alzheimer's and dementia patients. Um, the beta amyloid is what we see building up. Um, we also find the plaque um, found between brain cells. So that might be an interesting study for you to evaluate, and here are some of the details. Um, others, um, University of Pennsylvania did a study where they found three consecutive nights of four to five hours of sleep can cause irreversible brain cell damage. Um, Harvard did a study that basically antibi antibody levels increased 56% for each additional hour of sleep. Um, Harvard, again, one night of incomplete sleep can affect endocrine and immune system. And we can go through this. You can see um, these studies are also available on our website. Please be more than happy to go evaluate, take a look at them. Um, if you need more, please reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to provide them. Um, once you become a provider, we do have many studies. Um, hopefully it's um, a very um, complete library of research that is available on this topic. It is segregated um, into topics such as bedwetting, um, uh, allergies, asthma, so that you can see what the research or the current research is all about. So ADD and ADHD is such a current and important topic. I mean, how many kids are affected? Um, what I find interesting is the number of kids that are affected and the amount of medication that is basically prescribed is not equivalent. We find that there is three times more pharmaceutical um, drugs that are prescribed for ADD and ADHD than actual children that are diagnosed. 
So here's part of this situation. Um, the criteria we use to evaluate ADD and ADHD is the same criteria we use to evaluate sleep disorder breathing. Can the two symptoms be misdiagnosed? Absolutely. Um, we have also found current research shows that 85, excuse me, 86% of children that have a diagnosis of ADD and ADHD have a sleep issue. So what that means is if you see a child that displays um, ADD, ADHD behavior, evaluate the sleep first. Look at that underlying root causes before you start medicating. Um, you know, the condition might still be around the ADD and ADHD, but the sleep might impact or basically um, make that situation seem more critical. Um, I always wonder when I hear parents say, my child's on three medication, we're on the highest dosage and we really don't see any changes. Maybe scratch your head and think, maybe there's something else that we should be evaluating. So that's kind of the criteria. There have been studies that have been done on ADD and ADHD. Probably the largest study was done by um, a researcher named Karen Bonick. And she actually looked at over 13,000 participants. And her research showed that sleep disorder breathing increases the risk of ADD and ADHD by at least 50%. She also found that ADD and ADHD patients have little or no REM sleep, but they have Delta sleep. And on the reverse, patients without ADD and ADHD have primarily REM sleep and Delta sleep. The study that we did of over 500 patients, we found that ADD and ADHD was present in 25.2% of the cases. A statistic um, in regard to ADD and ADHD, 50% of those children diagnosed have been held back one grade and 30% are held back two grades. Well, kind of think about that. If it's sleep that's affecting them, I'm not sure if holding them back a grade or two grades is going to make any difference. Um, we need to look at the root causes and be able to identify it because it, it won't make school easier for them. Um, we talked a little bit about bedwetting. Bedwetting is an interesting condition that uh, I don't think they've actually pinpoint exactly why it happens. They have some very um, good evidence that it's basically when the body is out of balance, especially if um, the endocrine, the hormonal system um, is being affected by um, the REM sleep, um, the breathing habits, it basically throws the body out of balance. And one of the criterias or conditions that the hormonal system basically overseas is um, the bladder control. And they think that has something to do with it. But what is interesting is when we start the Healthy Start treatment on these children, bedwetting can reduce or can be eliminated in the first night. Um, many times it's within the first week or two weeks. So there is something that is in combination with when we are eliminating the mouth breathing, encouraging the nasal breathing, and actually getting the body back onto um, a more balanced um, ability and so that the organs and the functions that occur are happening in a more normal way. So the first appliance that we use in the Healthy Start treatment is called habit correctors and it does exactly what the name says. We basically address the habits. So currently we have treated um, 4 million children um, the appliances are basically FDA cleared. There's no latex, no plastomers. All appliances are BPA, phthalate free, BSA free. There is no silicone. We regulate ourselves to a class two medical device, meaning that the appliance can actually go into the body. Um, in the United States, um, these appliances are designated as a class one, but we want to make sure that we are doing everything to make our appliance the safest it can be for our children and our patients. So this is kind of what the outline of treatment is. We can't control what age the patient is when they come into your office, but hopefully this diagram kind of helps you with how the treatment will go. So if you have a child who say is five years old that comes in, this 
will be the series of appliances that you will use during the entire treatment in order to address the needs of that patient. So the initial appliance will be a habit corrector. The second appliance will be what we call a C-series, which will actually um, promote and direct the growth and development of that child. And the third appliance will be what we'll transition into as they become in the mixed dentition. If you have a child that starts at a very young age, say age two, we'll start with a toddler have a corrector. And basically we'll wait until that first permanent tooth starts to erupt. And then they'll start right into this series. And they'll use these two appliances. And that would be the only one that's kind of an outlier. Now, if you have a child who's nine years old, you would use the preteen or the youth series. And these are the two appliances that would primarily be used in the treatment of that case. Teen and adult, same thing, two appliances, and these appliances are geared for their dentition. So just kind of going over healthy start corrects, and here are numerous different habits, tongue thrusting, swallowing patterns, mouth breathing, low tongue posture, thumb and finger sucking, open bites, speech problems, listing, um, mandibular underdevelopment, and a narrow palate. Um, what we're training the tongue is basically a normal tongue posture. An easy way to talk about it is if we say, for instance, the letter N, where that sound ends should be where the tongue is placed. Um, most of the parents, when you discuss this there, <laughs> they realize that they not only have a problem for their child, but they might also have a problem. Um, we want to make sure that the tongue is in the right position. It's elevated in the roof of the mouth. The tongue tip is behind the rugae. Teeth parted with three to four millimeter freeway space. Slight spread of the tongue um, interocclusally, meaning that we are going to use the tongue to expand the arches. While they're in this appliance, we will create nasal breathing. And obviously we want lip seal or lip posture that is closed so that we are training the lips to basically tone them, but also um, create a condition that after the appliance is used, you've created and trained um, the muscles to act in the proper way to eliminate that mouth breathing. Um, here is the conditions that we are looking as abnormal so you can see what that position looks like. How do we determine if the kid has the proper tongue position or whether or not they're swallowing properly? Um, our suggestion is have a glass of water um, on hand for the patient. I would not say, I'd like to evaluate your swallow, here's a glass of water. Um, the kid will not know what to do. They'll look at you like, what are you talking about? But if you just ask them, just tell them you must have had a hard day at school today, take a glass of water, cool yourself down. And just watching them, how they drink that, you should only see the neck muscles move as you are drinking a water. Now, if you see any part of facial movement in the lower third of the face, you can pretty much be assured that there is um, an improper swallow. So it would look more like, so take a look, um, start evaluating your patients, see how they swallow. So what are we going to do about it? Why is this appliance so miraculous when we have these issues? And that is because the myofunctional therapy is built into each one of these habit correctors. So if you can see, there's actually a ramp that happens. So every time a child swallows, the tongue is lifted and placed in the upper palate of the mouth. There are prongs here that prevent the tongue thrust, but also indicate when the tongue should be retrieved. At the same time, she'll see these vertical tabs, and this is where we instruct the patient to flatten out their tongue. So they're going to put pressure on each one of these to start the expansion of the arch. Also, you'll notice on the lower posterior or lower portion, there are two kind of tabs here that's going to prevent the lower chin from drifting back. We are able to put posterior tabs with the appliance if we find that they have an open bite that will allow us to correct the open bite more quickly. So what is the repetition time while that child wears it at night? Well, it has to do with swallow. If you swallow one time a minute at night, um, you will um, obviously be wearing this for a period of time while you're asleep and you'll have 500 repetitions of this proper tongue position. 
If you wear it during the day and the night, we swallow two times a minute during the day. So you can kind of calculate exactly how much repetition that child's getting. Well, I'll tell you, um, myofunctional therapy is a wonderful um, opportunity. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of myofunctional therapies, uh, therapists across the country. Um, if you're in a large city, you probably have uh, better luck um, finding them. Um, and when a child is instructed with myofunctional therapy, they're asked to repeat um, certain exercise every day. As we know, cooperation is always an issue. And I, I love children. Um, we can't get enough of them. But if you ask them to do something, say you ask them to do an exercise 20 times, the child does it two times and he goes, oh my gosh, I must have done it 50 times. So we see that kind of um, problem happening. So by implementing the Healthy Start treatment, we can actually guarantee that myofunctional therapy is being accomplished. And being that we are repeating that position 500 times a night, that is significantly more than even what the myofunctional therapy exercise would be during the day. So if you have the opportunity to incorporate it into your um, practice and into treatment, absolutely. If you don't, um, we can still help and we make a tremendous change in that child. So either way, um, the opportunity and the option is yours. So in your office, what are you gonna be looking for? We talked a little bit about facial cues, but now let's look at dental situations. So we're looking for an anterior open bite. We're looking for a tongue thrust um, and swallowing patterns that indicate a tongue thrust. Excessive overjet with minimal overbite. Flared upper incisors, thumb or finger sucking, constricted maxillary arch, uh, mandibular displacement to one side, um, showing a crossbite lower midline to right side, lingually inclined lower incisors, a large freeway space, usually greater than eight to nine millimeters with lateral tongue thrust. Um, sometimes it's usually accompanied with an ex extreme overbite as well. Um, we look at this rolled lip symptom. Um, if we see a rolled lip, you can almost guarantee that you will see an overjet. This child has both overjet and overbite. Here's actually what the treatment looked like. This is after 11 months. This is basically in retention. So you can see what kind of changes we can make in the development of the dentition. Here is another child. You can see the initial and the follow-up. At the beginning, let's quickly look. Look at the profile, look at the lower chin, look at the funnel look. This child is not heavy. However, he appears heavy just because of this lack of development, um, improper growth of the lower um, mandible, especially. Um, if you look at their initial, his initial airway, it looks like it was three millimeters. Here we are at the end of treatment. We've gained seven millimeters in the airway, and obviously we've made Tremendous dental changes. Look at the difference within the posture of the chin, the profile. You can see there's definition here. So let's have fun. Let's look at some case studies. Here's a particular child. This is an interesting case. Um, an orthodontist that has been using this for many, many years. Um, and this particular um, child's mother actually was not treated as a child and ended up having surgery um, which she noticed the same symptoms in her child. So obviously she was very, very proactive in order to address these needs that her child has. So you can see the initial, you can see a severely deep overbite. Um, the child had many sleep issues. Um, this is what she looked like after the healthy start. You can see differences. Look, just look at the facial. Look at the way she positions, everything has changed. Circles under the eyes are gone. Look at her profile, um, obviously very nice dentition. Um, here we showing her through transition, um, retention. You can see that the case is well maintained because we caught them very early on. Here's some other cases. Um, here's a five-year-old. Um, child had numerous outward symptoms of sleep, um, including bedwetting, thumb sucking, um, a large overjet, um, 
hopefully my picture doesn't interfere, you can see um, it basically is guiding the um, permanent dentition in. Here she is two years later, and here she is at post-retention at 13 years of age. Um, what a change that word symptoms were eliminated and her orthodontic condition was also corrected. By bringing that lower jaw forward, we opened the airway and we're able to um, provide as great of an expansion as we could. Um, here is an eight-year-old, obviously large overjet, large overbite, um, flared incisors, um, same issue. Um, snoring, sleep issues, um, bedwetting, um, grinding his teeth, there's uh, numerous um, outward symptoms. So wore the appliance, this is just after one year. Um, you can see the dramatic changes that occurred. Here he is at 14 years of age and the case is maintained. Um, here's another case, obviously severe flared incisors, interesting case, double incisors. We can accommodate the appliance to accommodate that condition as well. Here we go, this is two years later, showing the development of the dentition, the overjet is corrected. Um, here he is at 25 of age and the case has maintained. Here's the frontal view. You can see the progression, um, midlines line up. Here's the profile. Here's another child, a little bit later, 12 years of age. Um, we were able to um, address this issue, obviously a lot of severe crowding, um, deficiency in the profile. We were able to um, use the appliance. Um, he was to wear it during the day, he did not, only wore it at night, and this is the result he had. Um, lower incisal crowding, easy to straighten, obviously no brackets, no wires, easy to address. Um, this has probably occurred in about one month time, it goes quick. Um, 12 month and healthy start, you can see before to after. Here's a picture of the lower arch, kind of showing what the transition happened. So as we're transitioning into the permanent dentition, this permanent um, lateral incisor is erupting. The appliance captures that tooth and basically directs it into the proper position, it puts natural pressure on the adjacent teeth that create the expansion. So as we are guiding these te teeth in, we're going to receive anywhere from four to six millimeters of expansion. So it is kind of interesting that we already know during that transition, you can absolutely count on at least four millimeters of expansion. And then we gain expansion as well from the previous appliance that we used to address the habits and using the tongue as an expansion device. So kind of interesting, um, doing it um, more naturally, obviously why the kid sleeps. So hopefully we've gone through a lot of information. Um, I you know, don't know if you have any questions. Um, Susie, I'm not sure if you are here. I am here. And I am. And we actually do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question is from Dr. Riley, and she's asking, do you ever see enough correction from the habit corrector to not need the other appliances? Well, actually, a great question. So I, I think a lot of it depends on age as well. So when we look at the habit corrector, it is really a miracle type of appliance. It is astounding to see what changes we can see just with the habit corrector. Um, there is a research study that's coming out that was done on a thousand children and looking at the amount of correction just the habit corrector can do. Um, the, the drawback is obviously we realize that habit correction um, is just part of the equation and we want to make sure that the architecture is created in order to ensure um, that stability in the case. So the second and third appliance, especially in the young child, is crucial just to ensure that dentition from erupting. I can tell you right now, 92% of the population will have malocclusions. And um, unfortunately, it is not every child, but pretty darn close. And typically, if we see children with habits, you're going to see narrow arches, and you're also going to probably see deficiency in the mandible for sure, maybe even in the maxilla. And um, I, you know, 
if if we were in a great world, yes. If we we could create correct everything with the Haber corrector, we would absolutely do so. Um, we want to make sure that we're looking at the whole child and looking at all the possibilities of the root causes. Now, sometimes with an adult, you know, we we don't have any more growth and um, development left. Um, unfortunately, we still see so many of these issues. So many times with that type of patient, we might only use the habit corrector. Um, they might be in braces, they might be in aligners. We see that they have issues. We'll use the habit corrector to address that area. So um, in a perfect world, I would like to say, yes, there is a possibility that the habit corrector can do it all. But in practicality, I, I believe that the second and third appliance is really critical in this treatment and the stability. I know some people say, wow, the tongue cr controls everything. Well, it does do a huge amount and it can cause huge disasters if it is not um, put in the proper position and creating the proper swallow. But we still see issues um, with crowding when teeth are erupting. And um, again, as I said, 92% will have issues. Um, you know, knowing that the overbite and the overjet, any of those, we can correct any overbite, any over, over jet, open bite, gummy smile, class three, um, cross bites. So there are numerous factors. And part of the process that we go through with the Healthy Start treatment is we will look at these cases and help you with the treatment plan, especially at the beginning, because it is so critical to understand. And we all know how we feel when we have new um, treatments that come about. So um, it will go through this and it will basically tell you what each one of the portions of the treatment will identify and address and when that time change should occur and basically what we're looking for um, during the treatment protocol. So hopefully, long-winded answer, hopefully I addressed it for you and um, you can see the practicality, but we'll help yeah. you with the initial and during the diagnosis. Awesome, thank you. And you kind of touched on this actually a little bit, but Dr. Um, Leon was wondering if you could maybe touch a little bit more on how the system works for class three cases. Great, great question. So um, class three, we basically have pseudo class threes and we also have skeletal class threes. So let's address pseudo class threes first. Um, what I find so interesting is um, probably about 15 years ago, we would tend to see uh, class three situations and maybe three to 5% of the population, pretty small. Now we see about 20, 25% of the population having pseudo class threes. And I always kind of scratch my head and wonder why we're becoming more prevalent. Well, um, my, my two cents is the body's a funny thing. We tend to compensate for deficiencies. So if a child is struggling breathing, well, guess what? If they slide their lower jaw forward, they're probably getting more air. So that might be some explanation. But the class three appliance is a very unique appliance where there is no front wall to the appliance. And there are three prongs in the back of it basically to help you direct the tongue. So the drum is actually going to be pushing against these tabs in order to direct the upper arch in a forward direction. So it's very simple. And believe it or not, it happens in a two to four month period of time. The patient is asked to wear it two hours during the day where they're going to be pushing on these taps. But tendency is, and the reaction of the kids, it's a lot of fun. It's almost like a game. But you'll be amazed. I say it's like magic um, that this occurs. Now, let's talk about the um, uh, skeletal class trait. Um, obviously, this appliance can be used, but let me stress to minimize a skeletal class three. And um, yes, we can make a significant difference, but I would never anticipate that we would cure it. We can end up maybe with an end-to-end -end situation, maybe a slight overbite but um, in an overjet. So we want to be really careful in what we're um, promising, especially in the skeletal class three. When you send in your case reviews, um, this will be addressed in full with you to explain what that is. Um, I will say in the same breath that we see that, um, yes, we see class three, but sometimes what's very interesting is we might have an ideal class one, but we see deficiency in both the maxilla and the mandible. And that seems to happen more and more frequently. 
and we have a uh, max A, which looks very similar to the class three, where the upper arch, the front shield is eliminated. So there is no um, interference, it's free to flow. So we can push the tongue against these tabs to move the upper, upper arch in a forward direction. And the way the appliance is designed, it's actually going to allow the lower mandible to um, address and move forward in the same fashion. So they work together in unison. So kind of an interesting additional appliance that we have in our toolbox to help these children so we can gain the greatest amount of growth and development as we can gain. Awesome, thank you. Um, which brings up another question. Um, how, how long typically, how many years typically does a child need to wear the appliances? And also, how, what do you find in reference to compliance with children who are two years old or who are toddler age? Yeah, I, I, I look at this question and you say, how do you get them to wear it? Well, let, let's start out with this. A two-year-old, do they wear pacifiers? Oh yeah, they do. Um, this is similar in shape. Um, I actually, um, patients say it's uh, more comfortable because it's squishy. Um, sometimes I'll ask a kid, do you ever sleep with a pillow? And oh my gosh, the comments I get, oh, it's the greatest thing. Oh, my pillow is wonderful. Oh, it's so soft and um, makes me feel so good when I go to bed. Well, I'll ask him, have you ever thought about a pillow for your teeth? Now, there you go. So the kids are very intrigued by that concept. And I said, why don't you check it out? Let's see how it feels. It is very soothing when you put it in. And um, it's, I, I always am amazed when you put it in a child's mouth and I typically let them put it in because they're all over it. They want to do it. Let them be the person that controls it rather than you trying to put it in their mouth. And when they put it in, they'll, they'll bite into it and they'll, kind of roll their eyes and you'll see kind of a calmness go over them. So again, it's very therapeutic. Um, some people say, wow, it looks kind of big. And I start laughing. Well, we see kids put their fist in their mouth, their foot in their mouth. Um, these are um, obviously large enough so it addresses the condition and obviously not small enough so they choke. So we want to make sure that we have the right combination um, obviously, all of the appliances have been FDA cleared, ISO cleared, Health Canada cleared. We, we go through the litany of um, regulatory um, um, compliances that we fulfill, but we make sure that these appliances are safe. So I typically would not worry. Um, what we do say is we want to make sure that a two-year-old is mature enough in order to hold an appliance in their mouth. Um, I would you know, we, we treat a lot of children that are autistic. We treat children that have Down syndrome. Um, these are children that have more compromised, what we call um, muscle tone. So um, even holding their mouth shut is difficult. So the appliance to remain in the mouth might be more of a challenge. If you have a patient like this that you are worried about that ability, I would suggest on the get-go that we'll have them wear it an hour during the day and we'll hope, uh, have them wear it during that hour until they're successful in holding it in their mouth that entire time. Um, at that point, then we would introduce nighttime wear. Now, if they're a mouth breather and they open their mouth, the appliance can tumble out, and um, we make sure a parent is aware of that. We don't want anybody to feel like they're a failure. Um, they can't gain control in order to keep the appliance in the mouth. Sometimes I refer it as a marathon. Um, obviously, we work to build up our muscles in order to participate in a marathon, and a marathon is basically completing the race. It's not the first to the finish line, it's completing the race, and that's what we tend to do with these appliances. Now, that was kind of long-winded, so here we go. The second question, how many years does a child need to wear these appliances? So um, the longest we would ever wear is, obviously, if you start with a two-year-old, the second appliance would be introduced when the first permanent tooth starts to break tissue. So during the period of that two-year-old and when that first tissue, um, tooth breaks tissue, which is typically around age five, we'll watch those kids probably at their annual or their biannual checkups for teeth cleaning. So every six months we'll see them. We wanna make sure they're wearing it. Each appliance, each case will come with an app and that app is wonderful. It actually helps promote compliance. 
Um, if they wear their appliance every night, they get 30 minutes of game time. With each wear, they get a coin that they can deposit in the bank and they accumulate uh, coins, which allow them to purchase something within the, the store that's available. Um, parents also monitor the sleep questionnaire that they filled out. It periodically asks them, have any of the symptoms changed? If they have, they'll indicate maybe a symptom that was initially ranked with the severity number of five, maybe is down to a three, maybe it's a one, maybe it's even a zero. But you will be able to observe that in the portal that you'll see. Also on every Friday, we will have them take a selfie of themselves with cheek retractors. So not only does a parent have a flip book of the process and the changes that they've seen in the child's um, facial improvements, but you at the office in the portal will be able to see those as well. Um, there's nothing better than a great parent to be your marketing effort. Um, wait, she, she sells all the parents at the soccer game about this. So once we start, um, when the first permanent two starts to erupt, again, what we would in, call it is active treatment. This active treatment would basically guide the eight anterior teeth into place. Once that is done, we will go back to basically uh, more um, retention. And again, we'll watch the kids and see them at their six month um, teeth cleaning appointments. Um, during active treatment, tendency is to see a patient maybe every six weeks. Basically, we're just monitoring the development of the dentition, making sure the teeth are coming into position. Um, once the laterals erupt, we'll move into that third and final appliance, and that's what they'll continue using um, for retention. Say you start with a kid who's 11 years old. Well, obviously, we're not going to end at 12. However, we're going to do basically a compact system. We might have them actually wear two appliances, maybe one at night to address the habits and the mouth breathing, and maybe one during the day, maybe an hour or two, basically to do the alignment and create um, the expansion that we need, as well as correcting the functional problems that are causing um, facial irregularities and impacting the um, sleep breathing and airway of the child. So typically we like to say treatment is completely um, ended at age 12. Um, how we get there can be different routes depending on the age that you initially see the child. Um, what we find is at age 12, a child doesn't wanna give up the appliance. So typically we'll say that active, the treatment is basically complete. Um, if you want to keep your appliance, you're more than welcome. Um, no harm will happen by continuing to wear it. Um, however, once you, if you lose it or the dog gets it or whatever, maybe we'll make that our um, opportunity to um, disregard the treatment at that point. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. I'm so sorry. It took me a second to hit that unmute button. <laughs> sorry about that. It's okay. Um, but maybe what we can talk about now is I always say this is just an overview of what we do. We do offer a digital class, um, which is kind of nice because it just started. It gives you the opportunity to jump right in. It is a six part series, and on um, we go over the material. On Monday, you'll get a two hour. Um, uh, educational video that you have the opportunity to watch during the week. Um, Fridays, we have a study forum that lasts about an hour and a half. Um, and it goes over, takes about 30 minutes to go over the educational material, 30 minutes to go over how to implement into your practice, and 30 minutes on how to talk to a parent. But what is the most ideal is that you will be treating two cases at the same time you'll be going through the digital series. So it, it's a great opportunity to have a hands-on, learn the material, educate yourself. Um, you will be shocked to see how many children in your practice basically are affected by this. Um, it will be a great practice builder for you. Um, I always look at it as what a service you can provide to your community. It will set you apart as a leader, as someone that is looking for the benefit, not just dentally, but really the overall health. We say when a child is struggling, the family is struggling. We have a tendency to see when a child comes to your practice in order to 
um, participate in the Healthy Start system, we see a family transition into your practice. So again, creating that patient um, bond with your families, as well as um, increasing your patient pool in your practice. So um, maybe Susie, if you want to take it away, you can talk. Yeah, about absolutely. And it's, it, it's and, um, yes. And it's kind of interesting because um, th there was one additional question, which was, do you require education on, on how to treat patients be, um, before becoming a Healthy Start doctor? So that was perfect. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen really quickly. I'm going to show you um, a little bit about what um, Leslie was talking about, which, of course, is our um, – digital education platform. So the digital education platform is fantastic. And like Leslie was saying, it really is great because you can work through this series on your own pace at your own, you know, when you have time and, and really we can work with anybody all around the world. I mean, we have, we have doctors who attend, we have a course as Leslie mentioned that just started on Monday and we have over 100 doctors that are that, that are attending the course which is just wonderful but let me tell you a little bit about how it works um, so the course is great because it actually as Leslie mentioned includes two full cases so the entire system for that child two children that you're treating so you know if that child you know has a class three um, that's included in that system if that child um, you know, depending on the age of that child will depend on, of course, on the system. You turn in that um, treatment plan or, or that case, rather, to Healthy Start, and then we um, provide you with not only a diagnosis, we provide you with all of your appliances, we provide you with animal cases for the children to keep their um, um, appliances in, even a compliance app, which is amazing. The compliance app is fantastic, and every child receives a compliance app with their case, which is really cool. Um, this course actually complements the ADA policy on sleep-related breathing disorders. And what that policy states is that it's up to every single um, dental professional to become educated on how to assess children with sleep and breathing issues. And we take it a step further because we teach you how to assess, but we actually give you a treatment for that child. We, we help you to treat that child. You receive a $3,000 voucher to attend one of our destination courses as well. Now keep in mind that this course isn't just, um, you know, we want your entire staff to actually take the course with you. So this includes your entire staff, uh, which is, I think, fantastic because we go through all kinds of neat things in the interactive study group. So every Friday, as Leslie mentioned, we have an interactive study group. Um, it's great because um, we actually have specialists that come on board every every Friday, a billing specialist, um, implementation specialist. And so we talk about all kinds of different things from, um, of course, training on pediatric, um, I'm sorry, pediatric treatment of sleep disordered breathing, and proper facial growth and development, development of the dentition, screenings for sleep breathing and airway issue, um, increasing your patient flow, but even things like how to talk to the parent. You know, how do you, um, and, and not just to you, but also, like I mentioned, to your staff members as well. So you earn 18 CE credits for this course, and then you earn 16 additional CE credits when you attend one of the live courses as well. Um, so just a little bit about what doctors are saying about this course. And I mentioned we do have doctors from all over the world that attend. And we had a doctor from Australia who attended, and he said that the digital course was excellent. All at Healthy Start have really got their act together and offer resources others strive for but rarely achieve, well-organized, passionate, and supportive. Uh, doctor from Canada, I want to thank you and your colleagues for this amazing course. I've been searching for a solid system to help my patients, and this is by far the best, most organized, comprehensive course I've taken. Doctor from Colorado, I have really enjoyed the course. We have identified quite a few patients that will benefit from Healthy Start. My business partner's four-year-old is in the habit corrector because he has had swallowing problems. And we've already seen great improvement in his eating. We already have three more patients ready to start next week. We can't wait to see their progress. And the cool thing about this is that most of our doctors, I mean, she was only, this is a six-session course. She was only three weeks in, um, in and she already had um, – patients lighting up at her door. That's what's so great about it. I, I, I love that we um, give our doctors two cases because it, that way you're, you're going through the education portion simultaneously while you're treating two patients. So we take you by the hand and we 
walk you through those two patients. So by the time you're done, I mean, you're truly ready to go. Um, ADA actually took our course and they said that it was ingenious, which is very high praise. So how do you get started? Um, a couple different ways. One, of course, is you can call or email. Um, as we mentioned, this first session started on Monday, so it's not, I mean, I can send it out to you immediately, get you going. You can get on this Friday study club, which I'm really, it's just fantastic. I, I really hope that you that you do this because it'll change your whole way. We had a doctor who um, has been so excited about this that he, um, he, he was actually featured on um, ABC News uh, last night. And, um, you know, really because of his passion for helping these kids, you know, once you realize that this is a problem, then every single, pa pa uh, every single child that you see, you, you see it, um, you know, you, you know that it's there. And so it's become his passion. So anyway, he was featured just because of, of how um, passionate he is about it. He was featured on ABC News and he has, he has been getting so many phone calls today, um, so many parents that are filling out sleep questionnaires for their children and sending them in. So um, anyway, it, it's really awesome. So another way that you can register, so the course is a $3,400 investment that, as I mentioned, you get those two free cases, you get that $3,000 voucher. I mean, you really, it's return on investment immediately because you start treating those two patients immediately. We are giving a $300 off promotion for attending the webinar. Um, so if you'd like to use that, just go to our website. You can go to um, www.openairwaydentistry.com. That'll take you to our digital education platform page. And you'll see that there's several register now buttons on that page. Just click one of those. It'll take you to the enrollment form. And there is a um, area to put a discount code in and just type in airway that's your discount code so just type in airway on the form it'll automatically give you that three hundred dollars off and we'll get you registered immediately i say don't wait now is the time and now is really the time because this of course just started so it's perfect timing for you guys uh, but now is the time you know this is this is the hottest topic this is the most important topic in dentistry right now and together we truly can make a difference so um, you can contact me directly if you would like or if you have any additional questions in reference to the digital course and my email is slafredo at thehealthystart.com you can actually hit print screen on here if you want um, on your on your keyboard and it'll um, save the screen for you so if you want to go back and um, revisit the uh, website where you would um, register or any of those kinds of things you can do that and then one last thing I'll mention is um, your CE credit. So, of course, you do get a CE credit for attending the webinar this evening, and that will be emailed to you. So, um, But if you have any questions, you can email our office at contact at thehealthystart.com or, of course, call at 844-KID-HEALTHY. And, of course, our website, um, which is um, www.thehealthystart.com. Um, Leslie, is there anything additional that you would like to add before we sign off for the night? Um, I, I just want to encourage each and every one of you. Um, I, I basically in the last two weeks, um, I've been everywhere. I've been to Hong Kong, um, Rome, uh, New York, um, Las Vegas, uh, all over the place. And I can't tell you what an impact this makes. Um, it doesn't matter if I'm sitting talking to someone that has absolutely nothing to do with dentistry and they look at me and they listen to what I say and their immediate response is, oh my gosh, this is my child, or this is my niece, my nephew, my grandchild. Um, this affects so many people. And I'm sure all of you tonight are sitting there and you're probably already thinking about a family member or maybe a patient, maybe someone that you've seen and you were treating and you just didn't put it together. And now you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to go back and take a look at this. Or maybe you treat adults. I, I always say to the doctors that work on primarily adults, I say this is everything you've ever dreamt could happen to your adult patients. You can actually do in the child. So I encourage you, please um, start evaluating, start looking at these children, let's get them healthy. And um, if you're able to, please join us for um, the digital class. It will um, educate you, get you ready to start. And um, there's nothing better than providing a service that not only um, uh, helps children, but really changes their life for a lifetime. So with that, um,
please. Um, I hope to see you in the future. Um, if you come to a convention, you see us, please look for Healthy Start by Orthotain. Please say hello. I'd love to meet you all. Um, and um, thank you for taking time out of your evening to listen to this, um, as I say, such an important message. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much, Leslie, for your time. And doctors, thank you so much for getting on. Um, if you have any questions, please let us know. And hopefully we'll see you on Friday at the study club. Good night. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.